friends of On The Pen, we've got an amazing conversation. This is a absolutely exciting topic to get into today. You're not going to believe what is going on at the University of Ottawa. So if you're familiar with the concept of biofarming, that's farming with a pH, it's this whole idea of in investigating the use of plants in manufacturing medications. And so when we talk about GLP-1s, these folks at the University of Ottawa under a program called IGEM, it is the student-led research group uh, at the University of Ottawa involved in this organization called the International Genetically Engineered Machines. This is a fantastic program that basically brings people from around the world together, students specifically to innovate. And this group, both Camille and Adam, represent a group of people at the University of Ottawa working on something that I'm calling grows empic, right? So it's, it's just this ability to basically grow the protein necessary for, for making a GLP-1 receptor agonist drug in a plant. So we are going to talk directly to the source on this one. I'd like to welcome in both Camille and Adam to On The Pen. Camille, Adam, welcome to On The Pen. Thank you Pleasure. for having us. On The Pen, or should I say On The Plant? Uh, wow. What you all are doing there is super amazing. Adam, can you tell us a little bit about the IGEM program? What, what is that, uh, that is spawning this sort of, uh, interesting creation that you're working on? Absolutely. Well, IGEM is an organization that is basically built around the democratization and internationalization of synthetic biology. So it's a, it's a group that really focuses on synthetic biology projects and on bringing this to undergraduate research and graduate research. So it holds a competition every year. So it's a year cycle where teams from all around the world come together, conceptualize projects, and then do research to carry out those projects and test their hypotheses. And then all come together to present it at one annual jamboree that happens every year and really is the world's biggest synthetic biology exposition. Amazing. Where does that take place? So that usually takes place in Paris. It used to be in Boston, actually, which is where the program was spawned from. But eventually they moved it to Paris to help with accessibility to Asian and African countries that were participating. Amazing. Who, who wouldn't want to go to Paris? That sounds amazing. Uh, so how then do you fit into this picture, Camille? Like what, what is your role within the iGEM program? So I'm a fourth year biology student and I was recruited among the team to be a director of research. Well, actually one of the director of research uh, for this past year's iGEM team uh, with, with the project that focused on the growing Ozempic plants, as you called it. <laughs> Yeah, amazing. So I, I've obviously learned about this by reading the articles that dropped. I think it was maybe the New York Times or something. Um, it was fantastic uh, a concept of this idea of of growing a plant that could produce a GLP-1 receptor agonist. So Adam, I'm obviously in need of more information about this. So, so generally, my understanding of what you're doing here is where GLP-1 receptor agonists like, like semaglutide, right, the active ingredient in Ozempic, or terzepatide, the active ingredient in Manjaro and Zepbound, uh, are made from a yeast-based process and terzepatide from a chemical-based process. Tell me a little bit about how this technology in biofarming would work to, to create something similar. Yeah, absolutely. So in these cases, and with most biotherapeutics around the world, including all of your antibody-based drugs, but also your GLP-1 receptor agonists, these are products that are simply modified from natural peptide or protein-based sources, right? So in the case of semaglutide and terzepatide, while they are made with two different protein, or two different processes, sorry, they are both peptide-based drugs, right? Which means they can be made in living biosystems. The yeast process is an excellent indicator of this, where we make that basically a precursor for that drug in the yeast, which can then be purified out. So you grow up your yeast in these giant fermenters, and then after that, you can purify out the peptide precursor and use that to make the drug, right? Now, in order to do that, we essentially have a yeast that has been genetically modified that can produce that peptide. In this case, with biofarming, we do the exact same thing, except instead of using yeasts and needing these big industrial fermenters to afterwards make the drug grow up enough yeast to be able to purify enough drug, then instead we modify plants instead that will then produce the drug. 
we can grow the plants just in a greenhouse or in a field, and it's much more sustainable and efficient at that point than having to work in these very bioindustrial processes. Amazing. Camille, can you kind of speak to what, what about the yeast-based process or, or the chemical process? What problem does a plant based solution solve when it when it comes to like maybe wastefulness or or harmful byproducts of the production of these drugs in a mass scale so in terms of the difference between the chemical synthesis and the plant synthesis there's this whole idea of um that the way that it's chemically made it requires a lot of chemicals um and it the, it's just not very um how what's the word like you need a lot of reagents to produce just one molecule. Not, of, uh, not efficient. So it's not, yeah, exactly. So it's not an efficient process compared to the plant where once it's modified, it will just keep producing your protein, in our case, the semaglutide, um, once it's been modified. And then once the plant dies following the production, it doesn't produce all these, um, these waste, this chemical waste. Um, so you can just purify directly from the leaf tissue and then the waste is just compost because it's plants. Right. Wow. So, so when we talk about the, the problem with obesity and diabetes in the United States alone, there are over a hundred million people living with obesity or overweight alone. How scalable is a plant-based process versus a chemical process? There, it's a bit different when we compare it to a yeast or a chemical process, but in, in both cases, it really requires like expensive laboratory uh, reagents and just space. Whereas in, when you think about a plant, for example, if we were able for in this technology to produce plants that are genetically modified um, in the seed form, then just think about how you could ship these seeds, for example, to developing countries and where they, where they don't have access to expensive fermenters or big well specialized laboratory equipment and they could just grow it in a field mm -hmm. um in if you think it's like agricultural scale fields it's a lot of plants that are all producing uh, your semaglutide for example if you're trying to scale up either your yeast or your chemical processes you literally have to build a new plant these are industrial processes that function in industrial pl uh, plants right Ma plant meat the, factories right Yes, sorry, of course. Yeah. Now we, we're talking about two different kinds of plants <laughs> right. now. We're talking about chemical plants, so factories, right, that are making these, these products from the yeast or the chemical-based systems. But when we're going towards plant plants, then afterwards, really, you're just growing your plant in a field. So you can easily scale up your production or scale it down as you need it very easily as well, because you're not building this highly specialized infrastructure. You're simply basing yourself off of standard agricultural infrastructure, which is widespread, very available both in the United States, but also around the world. So Camille mentioned developing countries, which is certainly another point of importance for, uh, for these types of processes where you can very easily begin to produce this drug in remote or in disadvantaged communities where you would not be able to build these highly specialized factories. So, so that's interesting. So help me understand, because when I think of a, an ozempic plant, I, I realize that is probably a gross oversimplification and not mm -hmm. entirely accurate. How do I ingest it to get the benefit? Because you're, what I'm understanding is it doesn't involve all of the processes that would be required of a yeast or chemical process. How does this work? Yeah, so, so certainly there would still be some amount of post hoc processing, right? It would not be a zero process, uh, zero process process, right? There is potentially a world in which if we can get to the point of the plants making the entire agonist, including all of the modifications, we have some thoughts on that, uh, on that aspect as well, where you'd be able to actually produce the full drug in the plant and then maybe have a plant that can be edible, right? But that's a little bit of a pie in the sky idea, yeah. right? where we're, we're not sure if the drug would even survive the, the ingestion process in that right. case, right? Instead of having it be injected. But let's say that you were to process this the way you would your normal yeast-based process, which is probably the best parallel for the plants, right? You would still, you would grow your plants in the field and then you would harvest your plants and there would be some amount of post-processing in a factory, but it would be a much 
a much smaller amount of post-processing than in with your classical yeast-based processes. Notably, because you don't need to have these giant fermenters, these highly specialized vessels that are needed to grow yeast at an industrial level. Mm. So you would still have some amount of post-processing, really adding in the modifications and essentially getting the GLP ones out of the plants and putting them into your purified format that you use in the pens afterwards, right? Mm. So there'd be a little bit of processing there, but it's much simpler and a much more standard process to set up than your classical full yeast fermenter. I got to tell you, the first time that I, I thought about, I saw the article and I thought about this, I just pictured the old stoner types growing their, their pot plants on the windowsill. And I'm like, what a world we're living in in 2025, where somebody could maybe be growing their own as Ozempic <laughs> plant out of their, out of their window. Um, that, so, so obviously what you're saying here is that the plant process and extracting the, the, ingredient necessary to make the drug out of the plant would require much less infrastructure. That's what it co ultimately comes down to. And then the byproduct of extracting that and doing whatever ha has to be done to the protein to, to make it um, consumable, to make it survive half-life, all that stuff uh, would be much less, much less waste involved in that process. Perhaps one day we will be able to get to the point where we have just all of us have our little azempic plant that's growing on the windowsill. <laughs> How amazing. What an amazing thought. And it, it is when you think about accessibility, that that excites me. Uh, so so let's talk a little bit about how this idea came to be. Camille, what was it about about the student group like how did you identify this specific problem is this something that canadians are are often discussing is accessibility around these medications or what was it that sort of brought this to the mm -hmm. surface well i would say it was back in 2023 when we were first uh, discussing this idea because there was this worldwide shortage of ozempic happening and it was everywhere in the news you would hear like oh big shortage of ozempic um and so we had to decide over, on a project that would have like a big impact worldwide because that, that's one of the uh, important aspects of iGEM is having is solving like a global challenge uh, but with synthetic biology. And in the faculty, we had the chance of having uh, an, an investigator that already had protocols for this, what we call biofarming. Um, and so we thought, why not use this science to make it make Ozempic or semaglutide more accessible with this technology. So is it the actual semaglutide mole molecule that you're mimicking in this plant or is it a more generic GLP-1 receptor agonist or novel? Yes, sorry for this. Yeah, it's a bit of a more of a detail, but it is um, an agonist, uh, a GLP-1 agonist because the molecule that we decided to express doesn't contain the, the post what we call post-translational modifications on the protein. Sure. Um, and those modifications are, um, from my, my understanding, are to allow the good ingestion of the molecule into your system. And so we thought, why not just try to, as proof of concept for our project, just start off with a more simple molecule that would be maybe more easily be able to be expressed in plants. Yeah, very interesting. Precisely, the, the molecule that we have been making is liraglutide, which oh, is okay. also a GLP-1 agonist, but it has it has a few pharmacokinetic properties that are not as use, as good as semaglutide, which is mm -hmm. where those modifications come in, but it is still a an active GLP-1 agonist. Yeah, yeah, liraglutide was sort of the precursor to, to semaglutide made by the same company. Um, very, very interesting. One of the things that I was curious about too, and forgive my lack of understanding about all this, but what plant, like, how do you identify what plant is used? Like, is this a stock of corn that produces a GLP one protein? Is it a, is it a, a four leaf clover? What, what am, what am I envisioning when I think about this plant? So when you, when you start a, a science project, especially in the short time frame that we had, um, we, want, we wanted to choose a plant model, what, what we call in science, like you have the plant, like the, it's the equivalent of the mouse, but for the plant science side. Um, plant everyone studies. Yeah, exactly. So there's a lot of like molecular tools and genetic information available in the literature on that plant to allow us to study it very well. Um, but most importantly, for the process of genetic transformation in plants, you need to have a plant that has a low immune system 
and not ev every plant has this uh, this feature, but the plant that we decided to work on is, is called Nicotiana bentoniana, and it's a relative of tobacco originally from Australia that has been discovered to have a very bad immune system, and so that would allow us to do these genetic transformations uh, with much more ease. Um, but this process would be possible also in other plants, for example, like edible plants. Um, you mentioned corn. There are other uh, genetic tools that you can use to transform these plants, but they're just less um, easily accessible for uh, a student-led project that has to take place within a year. Sure. I can't believe the tight time frame that you're working with here to, to con conceptualize this and bring it quite i mean if anything it's going to teach you how to innovate quickly which is which is very very interesting so this is fascinating to me and i i really think it's so cool that you picked a glp1 receptor agonist because you're addressing a global problem uh and and arguably uh one of the largest global problems that exists and how do you scale because when it comes to you know lily and novo who are the two manufacturers of these medications currently how do they ever scale to meet this demand but then how do we do it in a sustainable way? I just think that it's brilliant that you've selected this specific problem, because if if we can solve for this, uh, we solve for a lot of problems about healthcare around the world and the cost of healthcare around the world, which is something that every single country uh, deals with. So uh, so generally, the iGEM timeframe begins in January, and this is when the teams are usually getting together, pulling together all of the members of the teams. These are relatively large teams. So it's usually a core research team of usually about 10 to 12 students, but they're supported by other students as well. So they'll put together their team uh, in, in early January. And then really the bulk of the research work happens probably about March to August. In September, they're finalizing things up, getting ready for the presentation. And the, the competition itself, the Jamboree, happens in late October. And Camille, how many of these have you participated in? Only one. That was this my first, first one. And it was actually the first uh, iGEM team from the University of Ottawa who attended the iGEM Grand Jamboree in Paris. So it was a pretty great accomplishment. There are, there are two students. Unfortunately, neither of them could be with us today because of their final exams, the life of a student. But, right. uh, but uh, Victor and Tegan, those two students, the student leaders from last year's, really are the ones who pulled it together. Mm -hmm. And actually, when I started as a professor here, I, I was interested in iGEM as a synthetic biologist. But I knew that it had to come from the students for the team to be successful. And so I waited for there to be students who approached me about it. And they really are the ones who built the team. This was the project that we actually did last year. And so it was presented in October. Oh, okay. And, and actually, we were very successful at the competition. So there's, there's two parts of the competition. There's, there's a competitive part and a non-competitive part. Okay. On the non-competitive side, any team that meets certain milestones will get certain medals. And we did meet all of the milestones that they were looking for and got a gold medal for the, for the team. And on the competitive side, then they, then they rank, out of be, there's the best of category prizes. And we were nominated, although unfortunately we didn't win either, but we were nominated for best, if for bi, best team for biomanufacturing and best plant synthetic biology of the competition. So a very, very good showing, especially for a first time team. This is, I gotta tell you, as somebody who lives with the disease of type two diabetes and obesity, this kind of stuff gets me very excited. I love to chat with people who are are really innovating and passionate about what they do and, and very meaningful work that you all worked on. Congratulations, and I, I wish you continued success, and maybe one day we'll see these Ozempic plants in our windowsills. Absolutely. Thank you very much. That's our hope. Thank you. Yes, my pleasure.